Hey everyone, it's Ali, and today I want to answer a very simple question. What actually is Last Epoch? Now, Last Epoch is a game that I've been following very closely for the past few years of development, and I'm very happy that the game is finally releasing on February 21st. This is a game that I think is going to really shake up the ARPG scene, and in my opinion, I think it's going to be one of the biggest events in our game genre in quite a long time. Last Epoch is offering to bring quite a lot of systems from other RPGs that work well, while at the same time adding their own flavor onto all of it, making the game very much a amazing standalone experience. Throughout this video, I'm going to use POE as a way to compare a lot of things in here, since most of my audience is accustomed to PoE. And I think drawing some comparisons to how things might work in PoE would give people a really good perspective of what to expect in this game. Now, Last Epoch is going to be a game that's going to be centered mostly around its end game. It's going to have a leveling experience that you can progress through, and it's a relatively short, but at the same time, decently fun experience. Just because a lot of it is simply just run through the area, kill monsters, and just have fun playing your builds and have fun enjoying how it scales and how you put it together as you go forward. The nice thing here as well is that while you're leveling, the ability for you to respec both the passive points in a tree and your skills is very easy to do. So it offers a lot of experimentation and it lets you really try out everything your class has to offer if you're not specifically following some sort of build guide and you just want to see what you can do with what you currently have. The other really nice thing about this game is its crafting system. Its crafting system is so simple and it's so easy to follow and it's something that is literally a part of the game all the way from the first zone that you start the game in to where you can always keep crafting gear and you can always keep up it in a way that feels good and it feels impactful while at the same time not being such a mandatory system that you have to do it you can very easily get to end game without crafting a single item and simply just picking up items off the ground that are upgrades for your current setup with all that put together leveling feels really good in this game and it lets you get to end game fairly quickly which is where the true meat and bones of the game actually are the final thing i want to mention about leveling is the fact that it's really easy to level alts simply because there's a way to do dungeon skipping, which is something that you'll only have access to once you are a little bit more into endgame. And the nice thing is because you don't actually need to complete the whole story every time, you just need to go and get enough passive points to fill in your 15 additional passive points to get from the side quest in the story. You only need to complete the full experience once to get access to endgame and then you technically have access to endgame from a new level one character for the rest of a given season or if you're playing in standard where there are no seasons for the rest of the game's history. Now I wouldn't recommend immediately skipping to endgame like that because the endgame will be a set monster level at the minimum so you would have a very bad time but this does mean that you only have to complete maybe somewhere around a third to half the actual story every time on your next few characters meaning you can hop into endgame substantially faster. So the next thing we should talk about are going to be the classes themselves and what you can expect out of builds in this game. So Last Epoch is going to offer five separate classes and all of them are going to have three different masteries that are going to allow you to specialize a little bit further into some sort of fantasy that the class offers. So in the example of Acolytes, you'll be able to choose between a Warlock, a Lich, or a Necromancer. The Necromancer is going to be heavily focused on minion build, while the Lich is going to be heavily focused on life-based mechanics, draining life, using their life in different ways, and damage over time as well as some hit based skills while the warlock is going to primarily be focused on curses debuffing enemies and heavily heavily focused on damage over time picking your mastery will be a choice that you get maybe around an hour or so into the leveling experience and once you pick a choice unfortunately it is permanent so in this case for this character i am a necromancer and i'll never be able to pick a lich or a warlock but because leveling is so quick if you were to want to experience a lich acolyte for example re-leveling one really isn't that bad but as you can see here for being a necromancer i do gain some bonuses that no other mastery would gain such as having additional skeleton additional skeleton mage and 50 percent increased damage from minions while the other masteries have their own options now the other thing to mention here as you can see is that there are going to be passive trees for this game and they're not going to be super expansive like poes are but at the same time they're going to be pretty in depth every class is going to have a base passive tree so for example here is my accolade passive tree and it goes left to right with it progressing the more points you put into it at the same time i'm going to be unlocking some skills as i put more and more passive points into my skill tree and no matter what you are going to always have these skills unlocked as no matter what being able to put points in the mastery passive trees is going to require that you have a minimum of 20 points allocated into your base tree as indicated by this blue line here after that you can start putting points into your masteries and these are going to be heavily focused around whatever the mastery is based on so in this case for necromancer most of these points for necromancer are going to be heavily focused on making my minion substantially stronger now with that said these mastery passives are not mastery agnostic that means I can put points into the Lich tree as a necromancer. Now, while I'm a necromancer, I have access to my full tree. 
That does not mean I have full access to lich trees. As I can see here with this chain, I can only access the first half of the tree. So that means any of these passive points are permanently unaccessible by me. And at the same time, that means, for example, I would never be able to pick up Death Seal if I don't specifically pick up a lich. And the really nice thing about all this is that it's really simple to respect by just simply coming to town and talking to the respect master. All you need to do is just simply click on the points that you want to respect. And it just simply is a small amount of gold to respect whatever you'd like. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk about skills and how skills actually work. Now, this game is going to have quite a lot of different skills, and about 95% of all the skills are always going to be available for you at any given point. Now, each mastery is going to have its own mastery-specific skills. So, for example, for Necromancer, I would get Summon Wraith, and no one else would be able to use Summon Wraith unless they are Necromancer specifically. Now, with that said, there will also be a few locks. So, for example, I can't use Death Seal because I can never put 30 points into Lich. But for the majority of the skills, you're always going to be able to use them at any given point. Now, instead of having something like support gems like in path of exile the way the skills in this game are going to work and the way you're going to augment them to make them more interesting is that each skill has its own separate passive tree that you can put points into to augment the way the skill works now you're not going to be able to specialize in every single skill at the same time you're only going to be able to pick five and these slots are going to unlock as you progress further and further into the story with you having all five of your specialization slots unlocked as soon as you hit end game and the first three are unlocked fairly early on allowing you to play a pretty satisfying build from the gecko now the other thing to mention here is if you were to want to swap it's as simple as clicking respec despecialize skill and then simply just choosing whichever skill you want to specialize in the nice thing here is that you'll gain accelerated experience up until a certain level that's determined by how high of a level your current character actually is and based on your current character level as well you will start with a few points now all these skills are going to have level 20 as their default cap but you can increase these with certain points such as this helmet giving plus four levels to earthquake or such as this belt giving plus one to physical skills meaning you can potentially put more passive points than just 20 into a given skill if you were to stack things that gave you additional skill points now let's talk about the trees themselves so all of them are going to be able to allow you to turn the skill into some sort of utility skill or give you certain ways of scaling it or just honestly being able to tailor the skill to exactly what you want so we're going to use volatile zombie here as an example there's quite a lot of things you can do with this typically volatile zombies are really slow and you have to summon them one at a time if you want to make them faster and if you want to make them have an easier time to get to enemies, you can potentially pick up Fervor, which gives them movement speed, or Leap Attack, which makes them jump to enemies. If you don't want to sit here and summon them one at a time, you could potentially go and get Dreadful Horde, which gives them a cooldown and it makes the mana cost higher, but allows you to mass summon them in one go rather than you having to summon them one at a time. If you want them to heal you, for example, you could potentially pick up Necromatic Fervor, which is going to heal you based on how much health they had when they exploded. And if I wasn't playing a health based build if I was playing a ward based build I could make them instead give me ward if I want to make these give me support buffs I could potentially go over here and make them give me mark on death when they explode giving me overall more dps and if I wanted to specialize into making them do damage for example I could always make them do poison damage I could always make them vomit on enemies and I could potentially either make that vomit give me armor shred or potentially make it so the vomit itself gives me poisons and this kind of customizability is available not only through just the skill itself, but through other unique items that also interact with certain skills. For example, we have Tyranny's Bidet. Now, what this does, for example, is it's a javelin specific unique item that completely converts it over to lightning while at the same time making it substantially stronger. Every time that we use a javelin, we also gain a stack of thunder, which gives us increased spell lightning damage, allowing us to play some sort of hybrid spell and attack based build. And at the same time, you might have other unique items that completely change how a skill works. So here, for example, you have Gladiator's Oath, which makes it so your third Dancing Strikes creates a fighting arena and anything inside this fighting arena is substantially more susceptible to crit. At the same time, we also have a few sets in this game. And what I really like about what Last Epoch has done is that these sets, while potentially being very powerful, are very limited in their reach and are not like set items, for example, in D3, where you need to have seven different set items on and they do something. Realistically, the way sets are made in this game is they're meant to be a way for you to place a certain playstyle, while at the same time gimping you a little bit by using up one or two of your slots without it completely taking away all sort of decision making you have in your build by making the set item itself take up every slot that your character has. So for example here we have Belitra's Downfall. This is a two set of a staff and a helmet if I'm not mistaken and what this would do even if we just wanted to use downfall by itself is that meteor is converted to lightning and if we wanted to put on the two set we would now gain spell lightning damage per int so that means we could play an in stacking setup with meteor that would give us 
really, really good scaling on Meteor. Now, with that said, these set items are typically so powerful that you could potentially just use them as a singular item in your build. So for example, in my build where I'm playing a Archmage minion setup, I am personally using Lich's Corn just for the powerful effects that it does by itself. I actually can't even use the set for my build because my set doesn't actually work due to what I am currently doing with Dreadshade. The Lich's Corn set is a set that's built around making any minions affected by Dreadshade be substantially more powerful. But the reason I'm actually using this is not only the stats on it are great, but the stat that we really care about here is the bottom stat, 1% cold penetration for minions affected by Dreadshade per intelligence. I can never apply multiple Dreadshades to different enemies simply because I'm picking up points that makes it so Dreadshade can only apply to a singular minion. But because I am an in stacker and I have a lot of intelligence in my setup, I can get myself currently 85% cold penetration for that one minion that does have the dread shade on it so we have the normal rarity system that you can expect in the game we have normal items rare items magic items and in this game we have an additional tier above that called exalted items now this relic is an exalted item because it specifically has a purple stat on it and what exalted items are specifically are higher tiers of rules that can only be dropped. So for example here, we have tier six physical resistance. In this game, tiers work backwards to where tier six and tier seven are the highest and tier one is the lowest roll. And six and seven can only be gone as drops from monsters. For example, this pair of glove right here, if we look at it, it has a bunch of rules that say tier five. And as we can see, it's max craftable, meaning that the best possible non-exalted item you could make would be one with four tier five mods on it. Exalted items are really cool because this makes it so items on the ground are always worth checking and always worth picking up and due to the way filters work in this game to where everything drops identified you can set up a filter to where you only see exalted roles that you actually care about the other really cool thing to consider here are experimented items so for example these gloves right here have an experimented mod on them this mod is not available anywhere else in the game and is only available as an experimented mod which drops from a mini boss that you can sometimes encounter in your maps these experimented mods can be very powerful and they can do things that completely change how the game works and because of this these mods give you a whole new way of thinking about end game items and crafting now, we should probably start talking about crafting itself and how it's actually working last epoch. Well, this game, in my opinion, has some of the best crafting that has existed in any modern ARPG. Crafting this game is very simple to follow and it's very easy to learn if you're a new player. The way crafting works in this game is based off of forging potential. As we can see on these gloves, I have 24 forging potential. Every action that I'm going to do to these gloves is going to cost some amount of forging potential. And once the gloves hit zero, I cannot craft onto them any further. This means I am limited on how much I could do to these gloves, but at the same time, that makes getting more drops off the ground more exciting. And at the same time, just because of the RNG nature of forging potential, it's going to follow a bell curve where very rarely are you going to make something really bad and very rarely are you going to make something absolutely insane. But the majority of the time, you're going to end up being able to do something decent and you're going to at least make an item that feels either good enough or very strong. So the way all of crafting works is based off of shards. As you walk around the game, you will get more and more shards as well as runes and scrolls. And the nice thing is, as they fill up your inventory, you just simply click the transfer crafting items, which will cause all the shards to get immediately vacuumed into your crafting inventory meaning that you never have to worry about inventory management of any sort of crafting based material. And the way this works is we have different shards that give me different affixes and they are organized in both suffix and prefix shards. So for example here, if I want to specifically look at all my prefix shards, this is everything I currently own. All items in this game will have two prefixes and two suffixes they can add to. And as we can see on these gloves, I have an open suffix. So I could potentially do, if I needed, for example, life on these gloves, is I could click this plus button here. I could go over to suffixes. And I could specifically go and find the health shard and specifically add it to my item. Now this is going to guarantee that it's always gonna be added, but it's always gonna to be the lowest row possible. What I could do is augment this. So for example, I could use a Glyph of Hope, which is gonna give me a 25% chance that when I add this health shard onto my gloves, that it will not use any forging potential. As we can see here, it's going to cost one to 18 forging potential to do this. So if we were to do this, as we can see, we gain a tier one health roll and we lost two forging potential. So we got pretty lucky there on it not using much of our time with this. If I want to upgrade it further, all I have to do is just click upgrade a fix and this will make it tier two. As we can see, the Glyph of Hope did proc, so that was just a free upgrade to tier two with no loss. 
Now, these shards are going to drop like candy. They're going to be absolutely everywhere and you're going to have so many of them that you never really have to worry about them. Obviously, there are going to be some very rare ones. So for in this example, we have hybrid health, which I don't really have too many of as these are rare. But these are going to be so common that the ones that you're going to most likely always use, the resistance ones, the life ones are very, very common and all over the place. Meaning that even from as early as leveling, you'll be able to put resistances and a few damage rolls on your gear very easily. Lastly, let's say that we get an item that has an affix like this chest plate that has the plus one to soul fees and spell damage roll on it that I really wanted for my current chest plate, but I didn't want to change my chest plate over to this one. Well, what I could do is I could just use a Rune of Shattering. And what this would do is it would destroy the item and it would give me the current shards that are on the chest plate as shards added to my crafting inventory. Now, this is not a guaranteed chance to work, as in I might not actually get a level of Soul Feast shard, but the higher the tier, the more likely we are that we're going to get whatever shards it has. So if we were to shower this item, it'll completely destroy it. And as we can see, we got four level of Sulfi shards. We got one physical resistance shard and six armor shards, meaning that if I were to take a new chest plate, I could now take those Sulfi shards, which I now have 22 of, and potentially just add it to a chest plate that has an open prefix. Crafting this game is very simple. It's very easy to follow. And I will have a full crafting guide if you want more information on it. If you want some more advice on how to craft and how to make half decent items in the game, and that will come out in a few days, but it'll be out before the release of the game. Next up, let's start talking about systems in this game. So what I want to first talk about are going to be the things that people are really interested in. Ali, how is trade going to work in this game? Ali, how is Soul Self on this game? And is there multiplayer? So for trading, Last Epoch is doing something very interesting where we are going to have two separate factions they're going to be able to choose between and they're going to give you different things based on which one you pick. The two factions are going to be one that is focused around the auction house. And yes, this game will have an auction house. And then the other faction will be based on Solus Cellfound and buffing your time in Solus Cellfound. I have a full in-depth guide on both of these factions and I'll link it in the description below if you want to know more. But I'll give a quick rundown of how this is going to work. So once again, about halfway through the story, you'll be able to choose which faction you want. If you choose the auction house faction, Obviously, that means you'll be able to use the auction house and you can buy and sell items on there. But if you choose the solo self on faction, if you don't care about trading with other people and you just want to do everything on your own, the solo self on faction will allow you to target farm items easier while at the same time giving you massive buffs to a variety of different things that'll make getting gear in solo self found substantially easier. Both these factions are really cool because you can swap between them at any time you want. The only downside being that you lose the benefits of each of them. So if I were to swap from solo self found to trade because I started a solo self found, but now I want to min max a build and I have a lot of money, I can swap over with my current character. It does mean any gear that acquired during Soul Cell Found will not be usable in trade. And because I get to keep my gear, it's just unusable. If I ever get bored of trade and I want to keep playing Soul Cell Found, I could just swap back to Soul Cell Found and be able to use the gear that I already had. I think both these factions are a really new innovative system. And the fact that this game just has an auction house in general, in my opinion, makes trading in this game. That's going to make end game inboxing really, really fun to do. The other thing to talk about here is going to be multiplayer. Now, this game is going to have full multiplayer support on launch. And if you want to play with your friends, you can. And there are even quite a lot of decent builds that work really well in multiplayer that can be used as supports or a lot of skills just have different ways to actually help your friends out. An example of this might be that my skill does armor shred, which for me doesn't really matter too much. But for my friend who's playing a physical build really would appreciate that, meaning that I can buff my friend's damage by quite a large amount. Multiplayer is going to feel really good. And what I like about multiplayer is that it could potentially be so strong to play with other people that you'll be able to push endgame a little bit further than what people can do on their own. Meaning that if you want to experience the hardest contents and you want to play with your friends, you can do that and you're incentivized to rather than playing with your friends, making content very, very easy. So Endgame and Last Epoch is going to work very similarly to Path of Exile system, where you're going to be running through a bunch of randomly generated zones. You're going to have a bunch of different objectives to do, and you will get some sort of loot at the end for it. Now, the way this is all going to work in Last Epoch is through Monoliths of Faith. So when you first start off and when you first get to Endgame, you're going to be starting off in Fall the Outcast, and you're going to want to slowly progress through the different islands all the way to the end. And once it gets to the end and beats the three islands at the top, you'll have access to Empowered Monoliths, which is the true Endgame of Last Epoch. You can kind of think of this as your mapping progression at the start of a season in PoE, where you have to start in white maps and then go to yellow maps and eventually go to red maps. Once you do beat the three three islands at the top, you do unlock empowered monoliths, which effectively turn every single one of these islands into endgame islands. If we were to look here at Fall of the Dragons, 
Normally, if I were progressing, I'd go through the normal one, which is area level 85. But now that I have Empowered Monoliths available, I have a level 100 version of every single one of these zones, meaning that eventually all these become endgame farming areas. Now, what is so special about these different zones? Well, the first thing being that you have different glyphs and you're going to get these glyphs for fighting the end game boss as each one of these zones has your own end game boss. And it's going to give permanent buffs to your character. So, for example, in this monolith, I picked critical strike avoidance, being that 56% of crits against me just aren't crits. While at the same time, you could potentially pick up things such as increased minion damage, and you could even pick up buffs that increase the likeliness of you seeing things. So for example, in Fall of the Outcasts, I have a blessing that makes it so I have a 44% increased chance to see large idols, meaning I could go back and fight some of these bosses to re-roll my blessings to get specifically what I want if I want to target farm something. Not only that, but each of these monoliths are going to allow you to target farm something specific. So here in Reign of Dragons, Reign of Dragons is specifically specialized in farming swords, axes, maces, daggers, or pull arms. And what that means is throughout the echo web, you will sometimes see nodes that, for example, here are guaranteed to give you a unique item. But based on the area you're in, you will see unique nodes. So for example, here in Black Sun, if I wanted to specifically farm a specific shield, I'd come and do Empowered Black Sun as I will start seeing a lot of these nodes that give me a, a guaranteed unique or set shield, meaning I can specifically target farm shields until I get exactly what I want. So let's talk about how the end game actually works and how monoliths work. So each of these different monoliths will have its own large massive web that you can solely fill up by going between different echoes. You can think of these echoes as maps in Path of Exile. If I were to go do this specific echo, it'd be a randomly generated tile with randomly generated enemies and randomly generated objectives. The objectives in this is not always the same thing. It's not always go to the end, kill the boss, and then leave. Sometimes it might be kill a bunch of really powerful elites. Sometimes it might be defend a beacon for a few seconds while enemies run at you. Sometimes it might just simply be kill a boss. And you are going to get a reward every time you do it. So for example here, if I were to complete this one, I would get a fix shards. At the same time, I would also gain a enemy modifier for a few maps. So if you look here on the right, we can see that if I were to complete this one, all void enemies would deal 109% increased damage for six echoes. And if we were to look over here on the left, we can see everything that is currently stacked up together. The upside of this is that I'd also gain a rarity and experience for a few maps. So in this case, if I were to finish this echo, I'd gain 14% rarity and 12% increased experience for six maps. As we can see here, my current bonus is 163 rarity and 135 experience. The other thing to mention here is corruption. And this is where the true end game of Last Epoch kicks in. What corruption is, is a permanently sacking stat that is going to make the game substantially harder while at the same time making it more lucrative. As we can see here in the zone, I currently have 179 corruption. And this means that all enemies have 89% more health and damage, meaning that everything is substantially harder. And this corruption is separate for every single one of these islands, meaning that you can restart and you can tailor a specific zone to have the amount of corruption that you want on it. The way you gain this is very simple. As you progress and the further away you get from the middle, you're going to start seeing these nodes, which are going to allow you to fight the Shade of Orbis. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to fully reset your web. So if I farmed a bunch and my web was completely full all over the place, I could do one of these to completely reset it back to scratch where I only have access to just the starter node and whatever islands are right next to it. And this would also give me corruption. So if we were to look here, if I were to complete this one, I would gain seven corruption and an additional nine corruption from the Gaze of Orbis. Gaze of Orbis is gained every time you gain enough stability at the top to fight the main boss of the zone. Now, these bosses are going to be somewhat difficult encounters and they're going to have their own drop table of unique items that are not obtainable anywhere else. And... As you complete nodes, you gain stability to fill up this bar. And when you do fill up the bar, you can fight them. And if you were to fight any of them before resetting your web, you gain extra gaze to be able to progress your corruption faster. Eventually, once it gets a high corruption, if I were to do an Orbis that's really close to center, instead of this gaining me corruption, it might just reset the web or gain me negative corruption. Meaning if I feel comfortable at 400 corruption and my build can farm it really well and I don't want to go further up or further down, I can just choose to find Orbis whenever I'm ready to reset my web. That's very close to the beginning and it'll either make me gain a minimal amount of corruption or make me lose a minimal amount of corruption, allowing me to always stay around a certain level if that's what I choose to farm. Overall, I love the way that 
the end game works in Last Epoch. And I absolutely love monoliths. Monoliths are really fun to do and they're really fun to farm. And the fact that you can infinitely scale them to make them as difficult as you want, my opinion, makes them really, really fun to do. It makes it fun that eventually every build is going to reach a comfortable level where farming the corruption feels good. So for example, if you have a really meta build, that means you can push a little bit further, meaning you'll get a little bit more loots. Now, I do want to mention that the loot difference between very high corruption and medium corruption really isn't that much. It's an incentive to do harder content, but it's not to the point where somebody farming 500 corruption versus you farming 100 corruption means they're getting five times more loot than you. It's going to be a very minor increase, but it's going to allow you to push further. and It's going to feel really good doing content that's appropriately difficult for your current setup and for your current build, meaning that effectively everything is viable in Last Epoch in terms of being able to do endgame. It's just some builds will be able to push a little bit further than others. Overall, I think Last Epoch is an amazing game and I think it has quite a lot to offer. And I think that this game is going to be a very serious competitor to other RPGs in the genre. And I think it's going to be a very fun experience for quite a lot of people. I like that it has a lot of complexity and it has a lot of different ways to put your build together. And just due to the way the game is designed and how it allows for so much flexibility and what you could do with your builds and what you could do with items, you can play quite a lot of different builds. And so far, even though the game hasn't even released yet, just throughout all the betas, so many content creators have created so many fun and unique builds in this game that the sky is effectively the limit. I think it's going to be a very fun experience. And I think simply just due to how some systems are a lot simpler to understand and get used to that a lot of people are going to really enjoy their time with the game and I think their experience with it is going to be honestly really wonderful if you have any further questions please let me know in the comments below I'll be more than happy to answer any questions whenever I can or if you want to watch me play the game I'll be playing it live on Twitch every single day up until the launch of it and beyond the launch of it until the next Path of Exile season. So for the next month to two months or so, you can expect a lot of Last Epoch content out of me and you can always expect to see me play it on Twitch. So if you want to see it for yourself, if you want to come hang out with the cuties, I'll be more than happy to see you on Twitch. Other than that, I hope you cuties enjoyed. I hope this explained what Last Epoch is all about and some of the basic systems in it. And if you do plan to play yourself, I would appreciate it if you buy it on Nexus. It's the same thing as if you're buying on Steam, you get yourself a Steam key, but you get to support your local e-girl as I get a tiny cut of it. But if you just buy it on Steam, that's also understandable. Other than that, hope you kiddies enjoy. I hope to see you in the next video.